All right, final panel of the day. Can everyone, um, all the panelists say hi and let everyone in the audience let us know if you can see and hear all of us. Hello. 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 <laughs> I'm really excited to get started. So I'm gonna minimize uh, my video so you can see these lovely panelists more. I'll just be like the voice uh. of God. Um, <laughs> and thank you for being our final our final panel. We have lots of questions already coming in. Um, but for those of you who forgot earlier today, <laughs> we're talking with Matt Coyle, Naomi Hirahara, and Michael Conley about their work, about writing, about publishing, what they're reading. Nothing is off. Well, I won't say nothing. Most things are in off limits. Um, we are going to start with John McMullen. John, um, this question is from Matt. In the earlier session, you said that your first drafts are better than when you started writing. What are you doing differently um, that makes your first drafts better? Have you learned any craft secrets you can share? Um, and I think we would all love to hear for all of you um, anything that you, you do differently with your first drafts and what you've learned through your years of writing. Am I supposed to know stuff? Um, That's why you're getting the big bucks. I think it's just, for me, it's just it's just working the muscle because um, uh, my process is actually a lot more organic, we'll call it, than even when I started. It's looser, um, but it's just working the muscle for 20 years, um, 10 years without getting published. So I think that's what it is, or maybe I'm just lazy and I don't want to, although I do revise the first draft quite a bit. Um, thank God. It's better because you know that first novel. When you write your first novel, you're not under contract with anybody. Um, you can just write and write and write for months and months and years. Uh, but now, of course, you're always on um, on a timeline. But I wish I had some neat clues for you. I don't. I'm sure these other smart people will. Naomi, I'm it. I I kind of had a question for both of you guys. I just found when you're writing another installment of a, a an existing series you kind of know your character already so i for me that's a different experience than writing a new character um but michael you're it well well i'm going to blend what you both said i, I think there is a um i would say the same thing that my first drafts are in better shape than they used to be and it's mostly because they're shorter than they used to be. Um, it, my process is always to write long and then cut down. And so it's, uh, you know, it's ultimately getting to less is more. But now I incorporate less is more into my first draft. Um, you know, so I'm just trying to be, um, you know, that what that equates to is momentum. I'm just trying to get momentum into the writing process because that will translate to the reading process. And, and that's really um, what it's all about. The part about going back to the same characters, there is an ease in that. You can ease yourself into stories and you have a sense of what this guy will say or this woman will say right. in this situation. But you also have the pressure of knowing you can't you know, rely on what you said in the last book. You have to reveal something else about these characters. And sometimes that's more difficult than coming up with something fresh or, or uh, aspects of a brand new character. So to me, that's a a balance of, uh, yeah, there, there's some really good stuff, but there's also some some uh, um, task or uh, uh, obstacles in that. Um, but the, the overriding thing is less is more. Mm -hmm. Look at every paragraph and think, you know, what what is in there that you don't really need to say to keep them going through to the next paragraph. So going off of that, you know, all of you are multi-published, have been doing this for a long time. What are some things you wish you had known earlier in your career, either about the write, writing, publishing, or anything else? <laughs> it's a tough one. I wish I, I knew about things like this. Like, I, I, I was totally in the blind. I never went to a conference online or in person or anything, I, uh, you know, there is, there's something, um, first of all, when you write a book and even send it into agents, you're putting yourself out there, you're very vulnerable. So if you're writing your first book, you don't go around say, I mean, it's weird, I think some people do, but I never told anyone I was writing a book. And uh, I actually lived with someone that didn't know I was writing a book. Mm. <laughs> so, 
So, you know, to me, it was like, I'm not going to tell anyone about this till I feel confident that this is a book worth uh, being published. And uh, so that led me to where I didn't know about any of these conferences. And, um, and I think there is a lot of good stuff you can get out of these because I've participated in them since I've been published. But I kind of wish I had that kind of um, fallback or help, whatever you want to call it, back when I was kind of groping around in this room, a dark room without a flashlight. Um, which which would I equate writing my first book as? <laughs> well said. I wish I would have started earlier, and that's all. I mean, I didn't start writing seriously until I was 43, um, which was two years ago. Um, I, <laughs> the thing was, I didn't have anything to say. I, you know, I think that's mm. my excuse, although I was lazy. But I don't really think that. I mean, I, I wasn't a cop. I wasn't a. I wasn't, didn't really have any kind of job that was interesting. But, um, you know, you get to be a certain age and you had loss in your, in your family and things like that, which uh, can bring out some true emotion, whatever you write. But I still, you know, I wish I would have started writing at least 10 years earlier. But what would you be writing about if you didn't know? Uh, what you know what I mean? Blackout drunks, probably. <laughs> before, before I quit drinking. Yeah. I, I think, when you do that, yeah. I'll go ahead and name No, I no, but go ahead. No, but you're responding I just to what say, he's saying. When you yeah. start late, when you start late, I my first book got published when I was 35, so that put this weird uh, compulsion on me to make up for lost time. And I don't really know what time I lost, but I kind of feel it in the back of my head. So I am always writing and never taking a break. And so the late start, and in my opinion, what was the late start, ends up having issues for me 20, 25 years later. Ooh. I think for me, I'm glad that I didn't know a lot because that would probably have discouraged me from ever writing a book because it is very difficult, you know, and I think you need that. When I say a newbie, you know, I don't mean a certain age, but you kind of need the um, the naivete, the optimism to just kind of jump in and do that. And I think that I, I won't discount. I think that's important to have, especially in the beginning. I think that's a great point because it's you saw all the not knowing anything about the business and someone told you you're going to get 75 to 100 rejections from agents before for most people it's about average before you get published and it's going to take you probably three or four years to get a book that's even worthwhile to send out and that seems like such a big such a big uh problem to overcome but yeah if you just get in there i'm gonna you know i'm gonna be able to buy the house in Malibu next year because I'm selling the book. You know, that optimism certainly carries it through. <laughs> and everyone's in the chat sharing. Um, there's people who published their first book when they were 65 and one started writing at 70. Yay. So you're you're ahead of the game, uh, Matt. <laughs> <laughs> um, and Di just a quick question from Diana. On average, how many drafts do you do? She heard the average professional writer does seven. <laughs> God. That's that's not what I do. I do three, three. And is that just certain point? Is it a, a complete new draft or just certain parts of the book that you will rework? No, I go, um, I write it. I, I start every morning by rewriting what I did the day before. So I have a built-in draft into what is my first draft. Right. And then I do it, go through it two more times, um, you know, front to back, just go through every page. Um, yeah. You know, and, and I, even as I'm doing my very first draft and doing that build and rewrite, I have a ledger next to my computer with stuff I know. I have to go back and refine, fix, change, whatever. Um, and that usually happens in the second draft. So the average is seven for a professional writer? Mm -hmm. Well, I was a professional writer before I became a professional writer, and now I'm an amateur. <laughs> Well, and it also, I think, depends on everyone's process. If you're if you're a drafter, right, and you're just drafting and drafting versus... Same here. I was super professional <laughs> when I was amateur. <laughs> um, and then they, Kim is curious, do you have a mental checklist to make sure your characters aren't flat? Is there a process you go to make sure you have dynamic and interesting characters? No, I, I don't. I mean, I just as I read, I can generally tell. And I'm, I'm usually there's some sort of beta reader. I'm in a writer's group, um, although that's, you know, a scene at a time. 
But um, I can generally now at this point um, get a feel where it's flat, and it certainly happens. But um, I don't have I don't have any checklist or anything. I just read it. And I go, this is boring. I better change it. Yeah, instinct kind of tells you that stuff. You know what's I, happening I when you're I'll... writing happens when you're reading. I, I, I've s sat in all of the sessions today, as many of you, so yay. <laughs> um, it's, yeah. But what I thought was interesting, what Jessica um, was mentioning, the editor, that what she finds the biggest problem with her clients is access to the character's emotion, I think. And that was something I talked about in my sessions about character, like, that's been my issue with my current book. So um, I don't think there's a literal checklist, but you know, now that an outside reader has kind of identified this problem, I, I have actually an opposite issue of the two, two M's. I tend to write um, I, a short, I, I don't write a hundred thousand words, you know, and it's probably some of it's my personality too. I think some of it's, maybe being you know a journalist although michael's an ex-journalist too is to just to condense everything and to write short and so what i inevitably have to do is go back and fill it in a little bit more which in some ways i think is more difficult than the reverse than cutting i think it's hard to sometimes to embellish it more but anyway well, when i'm cutting i'm also filling back in you know there's weak po weak points that need to be expanded and stuff that shouldn't be in there. So yeah, definitely doing that. But um, like Michael says, I'm sure as Naomi was nodding her head too, we all revise what we wrote the day before. And I think that, that definitely kind of works in you know, another draft if you think about it. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Stella wants to know, when did you feel that it was safe to go full time? Was it after writing success or writing many books or what was the other indicator? How, what was your decision-making process to, to write full time? Michael. <laughs> well, for me, it was, um, well, I had a, a problem because I was a newspaper reporter covering crime. So I had this press path that got me into police stations and, and a crime scene and so forth. So I, I didn't want to give that up. Mm. And that, and that kind of kept me uh, doing the two jobs for much longer than I needed to do. But eventually I, I you know, I got a contract and I sat down with my wife and I realized I could go, I think it was two and a half years uh, you know, without the full-time paycheck that I had. Um, and so I thought, you know, it was a gamble, but you also want to have pressure on yourself. You don't want it to be, uh, easy. So I knew I had two and a half years to, uh, write a couple books that would hopefully give me another two and a half years. So there was a financial element, there was an access element. Um, and those were the big things in my life, uh, that, that determined when I, when I decided to quit being a journalist. Anyone else want to weigh in? Matt? I just lost my video, but that's pretty good because I just <laughs> stare at myself anyway. But, um, we, we see you. So. Yeah, um, I looked at, I, um, I'm not going to get too into it, but uh, there's some, I'm not going to go there, but uh, I, I looked at what I've been doing and what money I had, um, you know, investments and things because I really, really can't afford to um go full time but I, I decided two years ago to do it anyway i looked at talk to my money guy what i had and i i don't i don't have a family um i'm not going to get married again so i said well we may have to run this thing to zero but i'm going to write full time so i did that two years ago and um you know i can still eat and i'm a hustler so i've been freelance for a long time even before i sold my first novel, I was freelance, a freelance writer and doing nonfiction. So I'm constantly juggling. That's just my life. But um, some, somehow I'm able to survive. I and actually I, found it interesting. I, I don't know if it's interesting to anybody else, but when I, for, when I first quit my job, uh, you know, I'd been writing uh, for, well, I had a day job for 17 years, I think. So I had a real routine that I finally got into after a couple of years. And when I quit my day job, uh, I found it difficult to get into a new routine, which I thought was kind of mm -hmm. weird. It wasn't like I was um, 
not working, but I was finding, you know, I was working on other things, maybe doing maybe too much marketing or concentrating on other things. And I wasn't getting enough writing done, but I finally figured it out after a while. But strange, it took me months. And Christina, since you, most of you write series, um, she wants to know, do you know how your series will end or do you plan to keep on writing until you feel like it needs to end? Well, Naomi yeah, we just ended a series. Yeah, so it should be you two that answer. Well, but no, Naomi, you know, do you ha did you have no, it in mind? <laughs> right? Well, like, did you I, I knew I want, first of all, my character is an older man. Um, in the last book, he's 86 years old. And I do age him, so there's a chronological, you know, there's a limit there. And he's also, he's very much tied to a certain time period. He's a Hiroshima survivor, so he had to be alive, you know. So there are a multitude of things. And it was also a character very close to me, it was um, inspired by my own father. So I wanted a proper goodbye. I, I'm a midless author. I'm not a bestseller like some people. So a lot of times, One you know, <laughs> a lot of times you don't control, you can't control the ending. Sometimes your publisher kind of decides it for you. And so I wanted to get ahead of that. And that's one reason why. And I wanted to return my character to Hiroshima. So it had this arc. Seven is a good number. So that's how I decided to end it. And I'm very glad I did. Um. I almost thought of ending my character after book uh, six, Lost Tomorrows, the one that just came out last year. Um, I've got, I'll be writing, there'll be one that comes out in December, another one after that with Rick Cahill. And I can't imagine not writing him, but there's the sort of things in the business that, um, not that my publisher wouldn't want me to write more, and they do, and I'd love to, but like I said, I quit my job, so you have to find a way to, to um, make maybe some better income. So. I'm gonna have to try to write something new and that's gonna be a challenge, but I, I can't imagine not writing Rick Cahill as I go forward, but I think after the book I'm writing now, I'm gonna do something different. So that'll be a whole new challenge. What about you, Michael? People wanna know, is Bosch continuing? Yeah, I still write about him. Um, it's good to hear that Naomi's guy lasts until he's 86 because Bosch is 70. <laughs> so. <laughs> Um, 16 I, I, years. Know, part of the, yeah, part of the uh, <laughs> question was, do you do you control that? And yeah, the answer is yeah, I control it. And I I have an idea of how I'll I'll finish with him. You know, about the time I probably finish writing. So uh, not that I would reveal or talk to anybody about, but I think forward in that regard a little bit. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then also for Michael, Sue's um, series is based in LA, but she doesn't live there anymore. How often do you visit, stay up to date on the changing city? How do you keep it local when you're not there? Well, I am there. Um, I don't know. I, I'm not going out a whole lot now because of the virus, but um, I like living in the places I write about. Um, I'm kind of bi coast, so I grew up in Florida, have a place there, but. Um, my family's migrated to California, so I'm pretty much LA full time. So and maybe more of a question for just asking for the panels about writing in a place that, Michael, do you ever write in a place that you're not currently living or do you tend to write about the places where you're currently based? The, the latter, I get, mm -hmm. so I'm, I'm probably not qualified to answer like how do you write about LA, but you haven't been in LA. Um, so I don't know, I don't know what that challenge uh, would entail. Right. Matt, Naomi, do you always write about where you're based? I like, I do. I, I like it because I like to be able to get out and, and drive around the area. Even though I've lived in San Diego almost all my life, I still like to get out and go to areas I'm not even that familiar with or just drive around to get inspiration for particular scenes. But I did write a lot. The book came out last year, uh, Lost Tomorrow, took place mostly in Santa Barbara, which is only 100 or 210 miles from San Diego. But for me, it was even it was even a challenge with that. So you know, I went and spent some time up there, but not a whole lot. I went to school there a thousand years ago. It's changed quite a bit, but um, you know, I got I got what I needed when I was up there, researching and just driving around. But it was really difficult for me when I was hitting kind of a flat spot where I would normally just get out in my car, drive around, absorb. Um, not to, to not to be able to do that, I found I found it difficult, and I, I don't think I could write very much about an area that I don't live in. Um. 
I'm starting to do that at this stage of my career. And the last Masarai actually was in Hiroshima, you know, and obviously I don't live there. So, um, Matt's heard this story before, but I received a travel grant to, it was, I was only there for about two weeks, um, but it really helped to be immersed there. And I kind now, because I think some of it is with my Masarai, and then I have this bicycle cop um, series and she's young, Ellie Rush there. But it's kind of, I'm writing about an kind of uh, an LA that I used to know. And um, that LA has totally uh, changed now. And now with the pandemic, I think it's going to go yeah. through another um, evolution. But um, so I've actually been motivated to explore different areas. So my next historical is in Chicago, but it's 1944. So even though I go to Chicago, that Chicago's not there anymore either. So a lot of it's just through research, but through my Hawaii series, Kauai, I am writing as a Californian. And so it, you know, I've spent some time there, but it is a stretch and you will get critics that say, hey, you don't live in Hawaii. You know, what right do you have to write about this? Which is a legitimate criticism. But I just feel like I can bring something to this particular character character and, you know, and storylines. So, you know, I've proceeded, but it, it is a challenge, but kind of like Michael was saying in um, our previous pre-recorded um, uh, panel discussion, we as writers need challenges. You know, for me, this is a challenge that I, I'm not sure if I could carry it off, but I want to do it. Nice to write off a Hawaii vacation, isn't it? <laughs> No kidding. When we could go, right? I know. Um, Lauren, um, you know, is asking about um, turning the general premise into a full, detailed story. I'm sure you all are. You know, when you're walking around, or you have lots of ideas that come up, and lots of premise ideas or character ideas. What's your process for identifying which ones have legs, and then also how to flesh that out into a full, detailed story? It's a good question. I wish I had a good answer. Um, I don't, I try to start with an exciting incident and then I have an idea where the ending is now. Like I said, I've been in this guy's head for a long time. So what I try to find is a story where um, Rick will take it, he's a private eye, he'll take a case where they'll, he'll have some emotional attachment to it and um, he'll be put under pressure and have to make the decisions good and bad. That's what I worry about. I don't really worry about fleshing the whole thing out and maybe that, that maybe that's been a problem with a couple of books um, in the writing. But I just, uh, after doing it and having such a, kind of a organic process. I just worry about the inciting incident. What's going to put my guy under pressure? What's going to put him under constant pressure and, and have show some change. Um, and then I just, I try to fill in the rest as I go. Yeah. Not quite um, a it becomes, um, I don't know. It's an instinctive thing. I, I gather a lot of stories. I, I try to spend time with the kind of people that I want to write about, like defense attorneys or cops or detectives or whatever. And most people are really good stories when storytellers, when they're talking about their lives and careers and, you know, you gather that and, and you develop a, I don't know what the right word is, but you develop a thing that where, you know, that's an anecdote, that that's an offshoot, that thing could go the distance. That's a premise. And, you know, it, it deals with, I mean, it mostly, circles around complications and whether this idea can take you across a landscape that you want to write about like a, an issue or uh, you want to reflect something that's going on in the world today can this idea or this story that you just heard or that you just made up take you through that and and allow you you know to spin circles and 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 spend time in these areas that you want to write about. Um, but it really, for me at least, it really comes down, you know, to instincts and, you know, you're always throwing out a net and um, the fish you catch are of different sizes and you just got to be able to recognize the ones that can, um, you know, take you over 80,000 words or whatever your goal is. I think um, with my Masarai books, I had kind of certain themes for each book because I knew it was going to be limited, limited to about seven. So, so I think that kind of, that was in the back of my mind and that helped me to make certain decisions. But just like what Michael said, just 
I mean, we get a lot of people, I'm sure, that say, oh, you should write a story about this. <laughs> and you're kind of going, yeah, 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 yeah. But then um, there was a professor at a, a community college said, Naomi, um, do you know there's the Japanese garden at Dodger Stadium? And I said, no, you know, and there's kind of like this hidden garden mm -hmm. that I actually trespassed and <laughs> got into. Cool. <laughs> took pictures of and and then I go wow this setting there's something here you know it's not that known and I like to explore things that haven't been covered before and I think Michael you mentioned that too that you want to um, look into something that hasn't really maybe been written about that much so I think that was an enticement for me I would also say don't especially if you're a bit of a blank page you don't don't let the waiting for the perfect um, idea keep you from writing. If you know you have to work the muscle, maybe Michael has famously put away, which I thought was 400 pages, and I learned later it was 280 pages in a drawer. Um, but you got to work the muscle, so don't don't sit for three months because you don't have a great idea. I've never had a great idea. That's not me. Uh, <laughs> Sandra um, is saying that she writes historical fiction that's sometimes in the voice of a different ethnicity. Um, what are your thoughts on sensitivity readers? Do you ever use them? Do you think it's a good idea? I just wrote a book about a, a person, a uh, vision impairment, and uh, I didn't really have a sensitivity reader. I just went, I just tried to get research on it, but um, I know that's a big thing right now, and I know people have done it, but I, you know, most of the time, I mean, just in my, my tilted head, which becomes Rick Cahill's head. But um, when you're writing about something like that, you do try to get it right. I know I'm sure I got a lot of stuff wrong and, and you want to treat um, other people's experiences with respect, but you also have to put it in your own framework of what you're doing. But I don't know, it probably would help if I had someone uh, vision impaired read my book, all of it. I, uh, I don't know, I have, it's probably my age, but I'm kind of new to this whole concept of a sensitivity reader. I kind of don't even like the term because what does it mean? Like you're sensitive, you know, it, it, I, the way I look at it is you want to be, a, write a good book. So you need to do research. So, I mean, people have asked me to um, peruse their manuscripts when it was, because I, one of my expertise is in Japanese American history. So I will check over that book for, for, you know, for that kind of accuracy, but I don't view myself as a sensitivity reader. I just am, I'm just like a research, a resource, um, just to make sure that it's accurate. So that's the kind of way I'm looking at it. Uh -oh. I think that we should be right that we know. Did I, oh, anyway, yeah, yeah. that, that um, we feel comfortable writing about. So if you really, um, do not feel comfortable writing about a certain type of person. I mean, I just wonder, like, should you even go there? I mean, if if um, you are so removed from that kind of world, but that's just my opinion. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I must, I, I live in a bubble, I think, because I had never heard the phrase sensitivity reader till that question. No, you live in I've never heard that in my life. <laughs> so, but I totally agree with what Naomi said. It's it's about research. You you you'll get your sensitivity through your research. If you're going to write about someone that's uh, ethnicity quite different from you, then you have to research with someone who has that ethnicity, and then you know, and then you can get that person to read. Maybe that would be classified as sensitivity reading. But, you know, when I do something like that, I, I always get the people who I research with to read either the sections pertaining to what they've offered me or given me or sometimes the whole book. Um, and so I guess that's a form of sensitivity reading. But to me, it's about research. You just don't go blindly uh, writing about s some specific part of uh, life without knowing something about that either through your own experiences or through your research. Well... And oh, sorry. And speaking about the like sense idea of a sensitivity reader, keeping in mind too that when you're asking someone to read 
because you wrote someone in a different either ethnicity or with different physical abilities or a different religion, you're asking for that one person's opinion. So if someone asks me to read for a Jewish character or a gay character, I'm only giving my gay care, like who I am, right? My experience is very different than someone else's experience. Not every Japanese American person has the same experience. So I think that's another thing to think about is getting one or two person's opinion on your writing about for writing about their race, religion, physical abilities. Um, it's just that one person's opinion. It's not the quote unquote right opinion. Great point. Um, okay, we have, let's see. Oh, this is a fun one. Um, what mystery thriller series do you like to read and why? <laughs> oh, or lots. even just any series <laughs> or any books that you're enjoying reading lately? Mr. Conley. I read all Michael's Mr. books, obviously. <laughs> I read all Robert Grace, T.J. Box, T. Jefferson Parker. I, I like um, a lot of Irish and um, Scottish writers. Uh, you know, I'm not. I'm a big Tana French fan. Mm. I, I I do also like to read. For some reason, I like reading a lot of stuff in the U.K. in Ireland. Um, just because it's, it's enough different, it's the same but different, and it, to me, it's more, more of a not a vacation, but you know what I mean. It's like it's just more, it's refreshing. Um, I just finished. Uh, it's not out yet, but Ian Rankin's next book. Mm -hmm. and, you know, people. A lot of people say Rebus and Bosch are brothers from another mother, and all that. <laughs> they they are very similar, but they're so different, and I and I really enjoy that it kind of takes me away from my own head and my own writing and all that to, to visit a, another country for some reason. I'm on a judging panel. I can't get into the details, so I can't really say mm -hmm. all the books that I love, but I, I do think this year there's so many books by diverse authors. It's um, personally really exciting to see that. And um, I think it's really um, enhancing the genre. I'm also wondering to just kind of piggyback off of that. Um, would do you read books similar to yours, different than yours? Do you read at all when you are in first draft mode? It doesn't bother me at all. I know a lot of people don't want to read the genre when they're writing. It doesn't bother me at all. Maybe I'm stealing all the time and don't know it. <laughs> but I love the genre, so that's what I read. Naomi, I don't read a whole lot. It doesn't. It doesn't intrude, but it's more like it takes away from writing time because most of the times that I could be reading, I can also be writing, and you, you reach a momentum in your writing where you don't want to be interrupted for anything, even a meal. But you know, so but I get you know, I promise to read stuff, and then I have to get it done. Suddenly, it becomes a chore rather than a you know the fantastic thing that reading is. Yeah. Yeah, and I've had, normally I don't like to read a whole lot while I'm revising, but just because, you know, I have to because I'm part of the panel, I am reading a lot. But I'm I'm finding that um, because, you know, each book has its own voice and it's so different than mine, it, it's not necessarily intruding in my creative process. You know, it's it's more that I'm just admiring that there's all these different voices out there. Yeah. And then Lori, um, who is a pre-published author, was curious how, you know, Michael, you mentioned you had a press pass that can get you into a lot of places for research and things. How do you find the, quote, human resources like cops, lawyers that are willing to talk to you and take your requests for advice seriously? That's a really hard thing. I mean, I had it easy. I had a job that put me, you know, in, in front of these people. And... Uh, you know, so it, it's hard for me to say how to do it because I was a journalist and I, and like I said, I, I was with all these kind of people. But I do, I will tell you this, most people, no matter what their job is, feel they're misunderstood or they, people don't get what they're doing or the intricacies that they're doing. And so they react to sincerity. I want to get your world right. Can I spend some time with you? Can I shoot you some emails? And then, you know, things expand. I mean, so it's like, you know, I've had to do research in areas outside of cops and lawyers. And I found when I've done that, I, you know, uh, people respond to sincerity, the idea that I want to get your world right, you know, and, uh, you know, it doesn't always work, but I would say more than uh, half the time it does work. 
If you're Naomi, you just break into the uh, Japanese garden that's somewhere at uh, LA uh, Dodger Stadium. <laughs> so back the, well, the one thing, if you're in the mystery genre, there are a lot of people with really diverse backgrounds. There's a lot of ex-cops, there's even cops, uh, there's still cops, um, former PIs, what have you, all the journalists. And um, I've never really had a problem, even outside people I know in the genre, people really want to help you. They want to, um, you know, I've called police departments, I've called all sorts of different businesses. And I've only had one uh, person that really didn't want to talk to me at all. And I guess I didn't present myself well. It, it was a um, farmer in Idaho, a rancher in Idaho. Um, <laughs> I don't know, I just didn't come across well. Uh, but it's amazing how much people want to help you. And I always tell them, after I talk to them, you know, the only thing I have for you, the only thing I can do is mention you and acknowledge it's my book. And so the 14 people that read it will learn your name. And um, the, I've only had two people that didn't, that gave me great information, but did not want to be um, acknowledged in the book. One was a former Navy SEAL. And uh, I'm not exactly sure. He gave me great information, but not exactly sure why I didn't want to. And the other one was a banker. And I just asked her about safety deposit box, safe deposit box. <laughs> really mundane stuff. I just needed to know. She's like, no, no, don't put my, don't. Okay, the banking world. But people really want to help. So don't be, just cold call them. Do, you know, find find resources, you know, and but just give it a try. Be be polite, of course. Be polite, not only when you're talking to them, but with their time. And it's amazing how, how many people are willing to help you. Well, pre-COVID, there's a lot of um, different citizens' academies. I. I was in one for the ATF, but of course, you know, during COVID time, it's a little bit different now. And then in the chat, people are talking about Writers Police Academy um, and some other things that are good, good resources, I think. Um, we're almost out of time. Um, so maybe we'll end on this note for everyone. Can you tell us one thing that bugs you about today's publishing industry? And one thing that you love about writing and publishing today. Oh, and take a moment. Wait, ask that again. What was it? <laughs> when, when you think about today's publishing landscape versus when you first started, maybe, what's one thing that bugs you about it? And what's one thing that you really love about writing and publishing today? Somebody else go first. <laughs> uh, I, I'm just, Sorry to be like the Pollyannish person in the group, but I just something Kirby, um, the agent had mentioned in the previous session that that what was the word that um, that publishing is resilient, uh, surprisingly resilient, mm -hmm. and I I think that that's true. And when, when you like look at um, like television and um, film, it's all shut down right now. Um, mm -hmm. Yet publishing this little engine is still continuing. Yeah, um, a lot of printers are in trouble, so there's it's yeah. hard to get print copies right now. But still, you know, somehow, and so I feel fortunate. You know, I, I love the fact that Michael sees himself as a book, you know, a book author first, and not this fancy smancy screenwriter or producer or whatever. <laughs> and there, there's something. Beautiful about our profession. It's hard. It's unless you make it really big, you don't. You're not going to be making a whole lot of money. But it's like still kind of wonderful at the same time. Yeah, I think that's well said. I think anybody that knows me well and has read me knows that I'm incredibly optimistic. So I won't. I won't be. Uh, I won't say anything negative right now about the publishing industry. But I will say the positive thing is that just um, after all these years um, of telling myself I was a writer, but not writing. And then finally doing it when I, I was working for a golf company that went out of business and uh, I saw the handwriting on the wall. I said, well, when this thing goes out of business, I'm going to write. I'm not going to, there's no more excuses. You got to write or you got to quit thinking you're going to be a writer. And um, I spent six months writing the first draft of, of many drafts of my first book. And the joy I got there, just the, the, finally I was doing what I was supposed to do, whatever talents, limited talents I might have as a writer. That's why I was put on earth. That's what I was supposed to do. And so when you get into, when you start getting contracts and you start having books due that you do, you're always looking forward. You t sometimes I, I forget to just sit back and think you're doing what you're supposed to be doing. 
and you're having some sort of success at it and people are actually reading your books people are buying your books and they can't wait till your book comes out and that's such a cool thing that sometimes um i, I tend to overlook and um that is that's my favorite thing when i just realize that you know good or bad this is what i'm supposed to do and you're finally doing it yeah i i just want to add i'm um, not really add what both these people said is is exactly right i mean it going off of what Naomi said that it connects you with this, you know, millennia old tradition of storytelling to, to know, you know, like I've been very fortunate in my career. And so I've, I've traveled around the world to promote my books. And it's just, it's just amazing that a story about some guy in Los Angeles trying to figure something else out, mean something, in the south of France to somebody in south of France. It's just, it, you constantly get reminders of how important storytelling is. And then as, as Kirby said that, you know, we're in this, the world's kind of shut down, but people still need stories. And, and it's the publishing business or the book business or the story business that, that is, that is resilient. And there's just something, I don't know what the right word is, very cool, <laughs> very cool about being able to do this in our homes you know, we've all been in lockdown all our careers. Um, you know, so there's nothing new about it, but to be able to do this without anything, it's just, it's just you and, and you create these stories and if you can get them published, it's, it's very, it's, it's very fulfilling and that outweighs any kind of negative thing. So I don't really have a, a thing about publishing that bugs me that I can express here. Um, uh, I just think about how there's, uh, there's a lot of a lot of fulfillment in doing this. I love I everyone's everybody. optimism. That's so it's it's really great. Go ahead, Matt. Sorry to interrupt. No, I thought everybody in the green room was bitching about the industry, but I guess <laughs> more than that. So. <laughs> well, I think that there's I think that there's a lot of authors who are. It, it can be frustrating with you know we have a lot of authors whose pub dates are moving or whose yeah. you know books are out of print or out of stock because the warehouse is closed and can't get books. And it is frustrating, but it's a good mindset, a good reminder that, you know, we do have, I think someone in the chat said we have the best jobs in the world um, that we can do this, that we can connect with people all around the world um, through your stories. Absolutely. That's really great. Yep. Well, thank you so much for taking this time to be with us. I know everyone was taking notes and really taking everything in and you guys Three of you have a great rapport. Um, and so just a rem final reminder to buy all of their books from the Poison Pen using that green button at the bottom, um, support the local bookstore, support these talented authors. But they wanna keep writing full time, so you gotta buy their books. Um, and we're gonna reconvene here at 4.15, 4 Pacific, 7.15 Eastern um, for our final closing session, don't miss it. Um, and again, thank you so much for taking your time today. Thank you. Thanks for having Bye. us. Bye. Bye, Michael. Thanks, everybody. Be Bye. safe.